we we here on Okay, so I have to start, of course. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Maria Varaki, and I'm very happy to welcome you to the next webinar of the War Crimes Research Group series, uh, which is run uh, together, we run together with Professor James Gow and Professor Rachel Kerr. Uh, today, we are particularly excited to have with us Professor Cecilia Bayet. Uh, from the University of, uh, of Oslo, who is going to talk about the international law of peace uh, based on her very extensive and pioneer work on the law of peace. Uh, having said that, I would like to briefly introduce Cecilia, although she doesn't need a massive introduction, and then I will give her the floor. Uh, so, Professor Bayer is Director of the Master's Programs in International Law and Co-Director of the Research Group on Human Rights and Conflict, Peace and Security Law at the University of Oslo. Uh, see, her research is transnational and cross-disciplinary, that is upon issues of international law, public international law, but also human rights, refugee law, counter-terrorism, gender, women's rights, and of course, peace. Uh, Professor Bayer has created the first law course in the world on the international law of peace and she has published she is a very proliferating uh, a writer uh, with a variety of, of books on the legitimacy of international criminal tribunals non-state actors soft law cosmopolitan justice and its contents and uh, more recently uh, she produced uh, three books on the right on the international law of peace such as promoting peace through international law the research handbook on international National Law and Peace, and her more recent book published this year, 2021, on the construction of the customary law of peace, Latin America and the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. So being at the World Studies Department, I couldn't be more happier to have with us Professor Bayet uh, to discuss uh, about her, as I say, innovative work on the international law of peace. Cecilia, thank you so much. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. <laughs> it is uh, an absolute pleasure to be here at King's. Uh, my warm thanks to you for inviting me to be a part of the celebration of the 60th anniversary of the Department of War Studies. And although it may seem ironic to have a peace scholar celebrating a war college, it should be noted that the Peace Research Institute of Oslo actually has a seminar room called the War Room. So there is recognition of the need to study and understand these diametric concepts in tandem. So, um, oh, my, uh, my uh, screen. You can go scroll down and I guess. There we go. Yeah. Perfect. Yes, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, Peace has evolved from the notion of a natural right to peaceful coexistence recognized by Grotius, Pufendorf, and Vittel. Um, here you see them uh, reiterating this notion of peace being something that is owed to society, but also to, to uh, peoples in other areas. Um, this idea of um, promoting a coexistence within and among nations. And this um, was continued in the 1959 Bandung Declaration of Asian African Conference, um, uh, in which you see an iteration of the standards that we have within the UN Charter um, aiming to promote uh, negative peace. And this was linked to the non aligned movement and reiterated by China and the Soviet Union. And you see this most recently in the Declaration on Principles of International. Uh, law um, put out in 2016 by Russia and China. But if we look at the framework of um, international law within the UN Charter, you see um, recognition of peace as a type of universal grim norm, where the qualities of it are both substantive, that it's an end that we aim to reach as a community, but it's also a means, and therefore the articulation that we have an obligation of pursuit of um, Pacific means of settlement of disputes. And this um, articulation is reiterated not only in the UN Charter, but also across the world within all the regional um, institutions, as well as within um, the instruments on human rights, so that you have a linking of the notion that um, we can only attain 
peace if we um, respect human rights, that they are interlinked, that they are two umbrella values that go together. And um, the pluralistic manifestations of peace um, were recognized uh, by Kelsen as uh, forming a group norm that could be adaptable to local articulation responding to each nation's legal tradition and culture. So it doesn't have to be an identical iteration. It can be something that is flexible. And this, the uniqueness of peace in being both an end and a means of the transnational system um, in being able to be pursued by peaceful means means that um, it requires us to think creatively in the ways about to go about implementing peace. Now, when you think at, of um, the state of the world today, we see that many of the challenges are not related to interstate conflict because we see a decrease in interstate conflict. What we see is internal violence. And when you look at the normative instruments, the only articulation you have for um, recognition of a right to internal peace is actually within the African Charter on Human Rights, where peoples, the group, the society, have a right to both national and international peace. Um, and the African system goes on to uh, emit a normative instrument that also specifically links the interests of women as having a particular role to play in peacemaking. So uh, Rosa Friedman is a scholar who has been following and tracking the evolution of human rights instruments over time. And she's identified something that she calls a second wave of third generation rights. Now we see peace then being articulated as a bundle of communitarian human rights that are markers of what you can call a post-Western normative evolution of international law. So the other rights that you're hearing about in the news are solidarity, which is a draft that's being promoted by the UN expert at present, the right to development, which is soon to be approved as a convention, and the right to a healthy environment, which was recently recognized by the UN Human Rights Council. So these new generations of norms, they link back to already established human rights norm, and they form a bridge intended to open our minds at looking at human rights as something that will move forward in the interests of future generations. Thereby, we would be able to address challenges such as climate change, natural disasters, forced migration, pandemics, and economic inequalities uh, within nations. So if you see the articulation within the Declaration on the Right to Peace, this is not a negative piece, it's a positive piece because they permit, promote peace as something closely tied to concepts of uh, tackling equality and non-discrimination. It also has been articulated as a UN Sustainable Development Goal. Here you see them talking internally, promoting peace uh, within societies for sustainable development, thereby linking it also to another umbrella goal and providing access to justice to all. So the pluralistic attributes of peace actually enable it to serve a foundation for policy development at the national, regional, and international levels in the post-Western age in order to address the challenges related to increased social polarization and populist authorita authoritarianism. So the primary research, if you look at peace scholars, most of them have been writing about negative peace, the absence of violence. They're looking at the prohibition of aggression and uh, negative peace, according to Kelsen, was the only kind of peace that could be considered law. But I suggest <laughs> that at present, um, much more attention should be placed on positive peace. And these are the characteristics that were advocated by Johann Galtung around non-discrimination, equality, social justice, and cooperation. Um, the challenges that we see regarding territorial disputes, many of them, such for example, the maritime uh, delimita delimitation cases are being managed by the ICJ and by uh, 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 bilateral negotiations. So um, this is following uh, in accordance with the requirements of UN Charter Article 33, which calls on states to follow a mandatory um, uh, a good faith attempt to seek a peaceful solution of all disputes by negotiation, inquiry, mediation, conciliation, arbitration, and judicial settlements. 
So when I was looking at your website to understand more what your um, institution works with, I found this wonderful quote by Sir Michael Howard in which he articulated the problem of the 20th century as being under what circumstances can armed force be used in the only way in which it can be legitimate to use it to ensure a lasting and stable peace. And then I read on that he had actually produced books um, uh, in which he looked at the, at the notion of peace as being something that is invented and something that was in crisis because of the problem we have of the erosion of state society in modern times. And when we look back at um, the experience we've had since he um, wrote these statements, we see that there's a shift. We're in the 21st century now, and we recognize that the pursuit of attaining a sustainable peace actually requires other tools and strategies, because this is an underscored by the uneven application of responsibility to protect actions, which often failed to fulfill their missions and had an opaque system of accountability. In addition to the war on terror post 9-11 uh, and the use of self-defense against non-state actors. Um, this in correlation with the uh, uh, view that the, the real challenge is internal violence within states, um, really um, called as uh, by Mary Caldor as being new wars, um, goes along with the tendency to use narratives now on prevention, on use post bellum, that we're moving in a direction to prevent a reoccurrence of violence. So I suggest that the question of peace in the positive variant of non-discrimination, equality, social justice, and cooperation can help states, civil society, and IOs articulate approaches to address the root causes of internal violence and polarization. And instead of having a top-down approach to peace building, I'd advocate a bottoms-up uh, perspective that enables societies to design the strategy for peace that works best for their particular context. So for lawyers then, um, what we do when we go down to the national level, the first thing lawyers look at, look at are the national frameworks. And we have many scholars like Haverly and Gilliam that have really shown a breadth of different iterations of peace in national constitutions that vary from the negative to the positive level. So you'll find co some constitutions that talk about prohibition of aggression, that promote peaceful conflict resolution, and that talk about um, the obligation to use the mechanisms within regional or universal um, groups that they belong to, be they the ICJ and the UN, or regional institutions. You also have other types of constitutions that renounce the use of national foreign military. Costa Rica does not have an army, and uh, many other nations will not allow foreign troops in their territory, or they will prohibit um, uh, weapons of mass disruptions or nuclear weapons. And this links also to the increase in references to the peace zones, which extend to the maritime territory and apply then uh, to uh, the transport of nuclear weapons on, on submarines that have been in the news lately. The third form would be um, constitutions that uh, link human rights specifically to peace. And the fourth are that there are constitutions that actually give people the right to bring uh, a case uh, to court to articulate their right to enjoy peace either nationally or internationally, or um, to enforce the state to pursue its duty to provide peace to the people, or to um, articulate the duty of other members of society to um, implement peace. And these cases have been really interesting. For example, in Costa Rica, you had a law student who uh, was upset because the, the government had a website um, advocating its uh, allegiance with the United States and the invasion of Iraq. And so the law student looked at the constitution and said, I think that this is illegal. <laughs> and he brought the case and the court agreed with him. The court agreed that it was in violation of the constitution and of international law. And therefore the website had to come down. So um, you've had uh, some cases uh, in which uh, you have had courts uh, very eager to uh, recognize uh, the obligation to abide by constitutional standards. 
Um, and the last category then is a culture piece. This I think is really, really exciting. And it, it moves us in a direction that lawyers are not that comfortable with, but it goes into the idea of recognizing that um, culture of peace involves uh, creating new dialogues of cooperation and mutual respect. And this involves um, creating teaching um, uh, programs within schools to teach the new generations how to resolve conflicts in a peaceful manner, and also the use of ADR, say, in labor conflicts, which in areas like uh, Latin America can get very violent. So these types of uh, normative instruments are really relevant in terms of trying to provide a framework in which you can uh, work for promotion of uh, peace in practice. But when I was writing the, the last book on uh, Latin America and the creation of the customary law of peace, um, about every country in Latin America exploded in a range of protests. And uh, what we saw was uh, responses by the state were, that were largely oppressive. Um, these types of protests were uh, advocating uh, recognition of second generation rights uh, to an adequate standard of living, concern for a rise in food prices, in uh, a lack of uh, equal access to education. There were uh, protests addressing corruption and impunity, as well as what you'd call third generation collective rights. You had indigenous groups that were protesting uh, the poisoning of their waters by oil companies. Um, and uh, these um, articulations of demands uh, were largely met by responses by police and by military that were excessive. So uh, when the um, uh, concern of peace is raised uh, within Latin America, it comes with the concern that it is serving the interests of the state um, in terms of control. So it's an, an, an instrument of the state to have control over society. And this is uh, in keeping with the origin of Latin American countries of having a liberal statist uh, orientation uh, at their foundation and trying to, to inhibit repression. So what we see is um, international actors like the Inter-American Court of Human Rights will issue provisional orders trying to defend human rights defenders and um, open the scope for freedom of expression and association, um, defending peace in an indirect way where they're actually focusing on um, what you call first generation rights, but it's uh, addressing cases that at the base are founded on violation of, of second generation or third generation rights. And uh, the second way that um, uh, international actors like the Inter-American Court of Human Rights or the committees uh, can uphold what we'd call positive peace is um, through issues of uh, what you call non-repetition orders. And these non-repetition orders will address the violations of non-discrimination and equality of vulnerable people, including children, women, indigenous people, Afro-descendants, disabled people, the elderly, migrants, detained people, LBGT, and human rights defenders. So Judge Farrah McGregor identified a state duty of exceptional due diligence due to vulnerable people and the phenomenon of intersectional vulnerability, including poverty and marginalization and exclusion. And he said that poverty and inequality and social exclusion are invisible walls that separate societies. And these are the walls that we have to knock down to achieve development and democracy and peace. And so vulnerable groups um, face the challenges relating to recognition of their proper property rights or protection from displacement, deportation, forced sterilization, sexual violence, and threats to life. So what non-repetition guarantees do is that they call for actual education, <laughs> again, culture of peace, education, on non-discrimination and equality of people in power, meaning the border guards, the police, the army, the judges, and even medical doctors. And this approach is actually um, in keeping with the orientation of peace as a, as a third generation right that actually calls for the recognition of duties by the state to ensure respect for the right by state actors and civil society and non-state actors. So compliance with these types of non-state, um, non-repetition non orders uh, could be considered actually the key to attaining a quality peace. So here you can consider the caveat, there was a scholar named Kenneth Boulding 
who was really critical of uh, positive peace because he said that this is not capable of providing you know, solid answers to concrete problems. And I argue that actors like the Inter-American Court of Human Rights actually demonstrate that they can offer concrete recommendations to address the root causes of violence through these non-repetition guarantees. And the problem that we have here is that states are not necessarily compliant with these orders because of um, internal resistance within societies and a lack of political will. So um, when we think about how can we um, define peace in a way that would be contemporary, that would be address the challenges that we see today, um, one is that the culture of peace approach does include the tolerance of differences in equality, acceptance of multiculturalism, the notion of the importance of peace education, of sustainable development, of gender equality, and the ability of communities actually to be empowered, to have spaces for agency and communication to articulate and design their own vision for internal peace. And um, cultural peace, actually, it's really useful today because it seeks to combat cultural violence that we're seeing in which structural violence is actually being promoted through religion, through art, through language, through ideology, or through science to promote discriminatory or exclusionary policies. And these include the very many examples we have today of hate speech, of xenophobic narratives, and discriminatory attitudes within society. So um, the programs that are uh, promoting culture of peace can be found uh, within countries like Peru, in the schools, the Dominican Republic. They're often using UNESCO as the lead partner. And um, um, the um, uh, current president of the Inter-American Court is um, convinced that um, the only way that she can protect peace is to actually protect the vulnerable groups like women. And so she said that um, the court protects peace because the, the court protects women and women are the heart of peace. And so the uh, review of the cases that have to do with um, uh, gender issues such as IVF, same-sex marriages and violence against women um, were really interesting because they came at a time when you actually had mass movements of women on the streets of Latin America on both sides. So you had pro-women's rights, women's right to um, protection from sexual violence, to abortion, to same-sex marriage. And you had many other women and men who were um, on the streets as well, uh, demanding recognition of what they call family rights. And um, these uh, protest manifestations on the streets resulted in actual legal briefs, uh, amicus briefs being drafted by transnational NGOs on both sides that were then uh, delivered to the courts. And then you ended up getting decisions, advisory opinions from the Inter-American Court in which the majority decision uh, will uphold uh, equal rights to same-sex marriage, for example. Um, but you will have um, uh, dissenting opinions that will be drafted almost verbatim, um, copying the language within the conservative NGOs. And what you then, then get is a lifting of the battle for hearts and minds from the streets to the courts. And um, the language that's incorporated there is to um, sort of promote a degree of recognition of the plural voices that we have within society as articulated on the narratives that are presented within the international courts. And what's interesting is that you um, view that the narratives that are presented are ones that um, bring up issues of legitimacy of the international system as we designed it, of what our courts supposed to do, what is the role of the advisory function, and um, how do we manage um, when polarization within societies um, is lifted to the international system. How do we achieve a balance there? So the new phase of the promotion of uh, positive peace and the aspiration of an internal sustainable positive peace right now is very complex. It's really demanding, but it um, opens the door for international and national lawyers to cooperate to identify creative solutions to the root causes of violence. 
And I identify here uh, some of the key challenges that I'm seeing. Well, one is that we see we do see a trend, like Michael Howard said, that we do see a trend uh, towards constitutional rejection that states are um, weakened, either where you see uh, the executive um, strengthened uh, to the detriment of the judiciary um, or the, Cong the Congress polarized. You see elected authoritarianism, nativism, and corruption. You see a backlash against all, not only the Inter-American Court, but all human rights courts and committees. You have real a questioning of, of whether the LBGT cases or decisions regarding prohibition of amnesties are things that are uh, contentious. And um, a real concern about how do we build a bridge between liberal and conservative elements within society. Now, one thing the UN has started is a program called Faith for Rights, in which they try to build bridges between faith communities and the UN human rights bodies. And this is an area um, of potential great um, uh, possibilities for cooperation, especially when you think about the third generation rights being communitarian orientation, that there is a possibility that we can view um, uh, bridges to be built on them. Um, the tension that is the most um, problematic is uh, the priority of states to use peace as an instrument of control against the first generation rights of expression and association, and the limitation of civil society of their ability to use peace, culture of peace as emancipation, because we see um, civil society under attack under the guise of counterterrorism, counter separatism, counter extremism. So going into that area and trying to uh, open the spaces for uh, a healthy uh, active civil, civil society is, is a real challenge. How do we construct a pro homine version of peace means a pro human rights that that idea that peace is linked to human rights. And the idea that equality piece actually uh, requires us looking at the use of the procedures that we identified in the beginning, beginning of uh, conflict resolution, of recognition of procedural values like mutual respect and cooperation to be promoted. And the problem with using courts is that you'll always have a side that wins and a side that loses. So um, the idea that maybe we shouldn't be going to court to um, solve some of these conflicts means that we maybe we need to use new approaches that don't have anything to do with litigation because litigation won't necessarily bring us to peace even though they will solve a legal question. And the last element is this idea that human rights, democracy, and development uh, were values that were articulated in many of the instruments as going together, these umbrella values all of them um, uh, have different levels of support in international society today. So maybe we need to look at them and um, discuss to what extent um, they can be used to strengthen each other and how we can develop them in a common manner. So those are my uh, reflections today. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Cecilia. This was so interesting, so rich. I can say I was taking notes while you were talking all the time, you know, about the evolution of, of our understanding of peace, you know, as a right as well in international law, and especially the shift from negative to positive peace, you know, and with the third generation, which is fascinating. Uh, I can see there are some questions already on the q and I have my own questions, but I would like to give the floor and encourage our participants, you know, to put questions, raise their hand if they can also want to you know to ask the question uh so um i'm going to i see from helena who who asked a question um do you really believe that the universal definition of sustainable peace will help contribute to increasing culture of peace internationally and in the local environment or this is more of a symbolic definition for international ngos what ways are more productive to increase culture of peace around the world uh, maybe you can start with that. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, Helena. Great question. No, thank you. Great question, Helena. <laughs> okay. Um, so the if you look at the right to peace, the way it's drafted, it's it's drafted in a in a broad manner. Um, where they left it sort of vague. This they you should enjoy your peace in relation to human rights and. It's drafted vaguely, as most of international law is, <laughs> in order to allow states to match um, the narrative to their national 
um, understanding. So I showed that the constitutions have different orientations. And so when you look at the Declaration of the Right to Peace, it should be read in harmony um, with uh, the, the notions that they have in their internal system. But when you think at um, uh, really contentious cases like Venezuela, for example, one of the biggest advocates of the right to peace is Maduro. So Maduro is arguing that, that he is defending the Venezuelan people's right to peace because he's defending the state um, against intervention in the form of coercive sanctions by the United States that he feels are um, limiting uh, the people's right uh, to food, right? And um, he's uh, very concerned about possible military intervention as well. But Venezuela was one of the nations that voted for the right to peace. And if you look at the definition of the right to peace, um, there is an understanding that Maduro shares the obligation to ensure the well being of his own society. And so, therefore, he can't only um, present a version of a right to peace that would be negative in terms of non intervention, but he also has a positive obligation to ensure the well being of society. And so that it can be used against him, had that his understanding of the right to peace is not in keeping with what you call a pro homine peace. So it might be uh, a symbolic uh, value, as you're, as you're stating, Helena, but um, we use narratives today in international affairs and international law in order to promote policy changes and in order to promote um, actual practical changes. So um, the building of the narrative uh, is, is usually something that is very sophisticated and, and, and you'll see how it's uh, manipulated and used by either side because they, they are trying to implement a concrete change. I think that the most productive form of uh, promoting culture of peace is to strengthen those type institutions within the UN system and the regional system that have never received enough funding. We have UNESCO and we have peace commissions at every level, the UN level and the, the regional levels. These places are underfunded. And um, if maybe we took part of the budget that we use on counterterrorism and counter extremism and moved it to UNESCO and to, to the commission of peace, institutions that maybe we'd, we would be able to support the school systems um, and uh, the ADR local mechanisms. There are many, um, many, many children, for example, in Colombia after the signing of the peace accord that um, were not um, considered to have been recruited by the FARC. They were considered to have been recruited by other non-state actors. Today, we call them transnational criminal actors involved in drug trade. These children are not uh, included within uh, programs on, of official reintegration. More often, they're put into um, processing or judicial processing of accountability for crimes. And there, you're looking at um, Colombia possibly going in a direction that is going to weaken the peace because instead of sending the children within um, culture of peace programs to enable mutual respect and account of, um, uh, cooperation, um, they're being held uh, accountable um, uh, due to their uh, misfortune of being linked to the, to the wrong types of groups in the wrong time. Hmm. Thank you very much about that. <laughs> it's quite interesting that you mentioned Maduro, thinking about yeah. the current developments we have, you know, before yeah. the ICC. Uh, where mm -hmm. the prosecutor decided to open an investigation, you know, in Venezuela, you know, for, for crimes mm -hmm. against humanity. But I will ask more about that. There is another uh, question by Catherine. Catherine, first of all, she thanks you, you know, for the very interesting presentation. And this is wondering which impacts uh, the emergence of the digital space as an inherently transnational sphere has on peace and security. Do you think that, see, as to what extent can human rights mechanisms respond to these challenges? You know, when yeah. to peace. Thank you. That's, that, Catherine, that's a great question. Um, we have, like everything, positives and negatives. So um, I'll start with the negatives. The negatives is that we see that the um, that the the extreme right has more control of the digital space than what we'd call the liberal the liberal. Um, interest group, that they have been uh, more expert at um, delivering their narratives, the narratives that we're fighting over. Um, the same with uh, extremist groups that seek to radicalize our youth um, have been very, very sophisticated at dominating these spaces, and we are uh, light years behind them. So um, that's why you're seeing output from the UN um, addressing maybe the need 
to relook at freedom of expression uh, in a need to um, look at to what extent it promotes um, bigotry, uh, hate speech, um, structural violence against marginalized groups. And, and this type of the robot action plan for human rights, you might wanna look for against hate speech. Uh, this action plan creates a six point frame, framework for addressing uh, speech that is out there in, in the digital space that is harmful. So they're advocating that states actually go in and uh, corporations like uh, Facebook, which I think has used the robot action plan uh, to try and limit um, what is out there. On the positive is that for countries that are locked, like uh, Kashmir, <laughs> you know, Myanmar and even Venezuela, the Venezuelans are everywhere, and um, many have come out of Kashmir as well. You have refugees and expat groups in many different areas, and the only thing um, that they can do is actually use social media to talk about um, the uh, human rights concerns that they have, one of which is being separated from their families. And so um, here you get a, a possibility for people to not have to rely on waiting to go to court and get the right to truth um, in 20 years from international court, but seeking the right to truth immediately on the digital platform in talking about um, the types of violations they've been subjected to and telling their stories and in demanding peace uh, in real time. So doing this in videos and movies um, is actually uh, really, really enlightening in terms of the possibilities of promoting peace. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, is there any other question of someone who would like to raise uh, her, his hand before I step in because I have a couple of questions or I don't know if Cecilia, would you like to, to, to comment further on something of the issues that you have already <laughs> discussed? Uh, okay, we still have time. So um, I, I want to ask you about three points, you know, if it is okay. You know, I found it really, really uh, fascinating your observation that maybe we should move beyond litigation. Okay, when it comes to, to peace and uh, maybe some respect. And, and, and this is very, very um, intriguing when it comes from, a, from, from lawyers, you know, from legal scholars, you know, because usually uh, one of our first courses, is let's go to court. Okay, let's go to court, litigation, strategic litigation. I'm not here to diminish that, but, but it's a valuable tool. And it's something that we see in the climate, on the climate change uh, front, you know, that strategic litigation linked to human rights becomes more and more active. And I was wondering, you know, what are your thoughts about that? And, and uh, to what extent do you sense that the, the understanding of peace differ? Of course, it's a much broader uh, concept, you know, but uh, to what extent, you know, uh, can allow this moving beyond litigation. That's the first question. So if it's okay, I can see the mm -hmm. question of the, of the Q and A. So maybe I should um, I should stop. But if you have time towards the end, I found also very interesting. You know, your latest book about Latin America, and already from your presentation, you focus a lot on the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and developments. You know, in Latin America, and maybe you know, um, obviously Latin America has a distinctive. Uh, um, it is, it is a different uh, region, but uh, again, you know, this further development of peace there is very intriguing and maybe it would be nice if you could elaborate a little bit on that. And then I will go into the questions, if it's okay, the other questions, you know, if you. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, okay, so beyond litigation. Well, I started thinking about beyond litigation when I was talking to the lawyers of the court who were a little nervous that I was raising peace as something that would be justiciable. They were, the lawyers were, were wondering what, what is the added value of making peace justiciable? Isn't peace one of those things that it's better to, to address it within a non-litigious uh, setting? And um, I started uh, reflecting that the value comes precisely in the non-repetition um, guarantees that it's there when um, the court is issuing um, orders that are seeking to repair structural violence that are thinking in the long term. These are orders that cannot be implemented, even though the court is trying and they try, they issue orders that say, okay, this should be implemented within one year or hopefully within two years or within five years. And obviously there are lots of delays, but but um, it's 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 something that could enable not just the concrete parties to a specific legal conflict, um, 
it's also, um, there are many people and groups that don't have the luxury of having connections to lawyers in New York or Washington or even Costa Rica. So that when you have, for example, um, the Awastinji case in Nicaragua, um, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights received a lot of attention because they recognized the obligation of the state to demarcate the indigenous people's um, territory. And so um, all the scholars around the world wrote very long law review articles discussing how important this decision was. And um, when the state went to demarcate the land, they found that there were other indigenous smaller groups that had not been represented in Costa Rica, <laughs> that had not had contact with a lawyer. So it wasn't that easy because it, it's never just A and B. Usually um, in situations that have erupted in violence, there are a plethora of actors and interests that are unlikely to be represented within litigation. So uh, invariably, when you're seeking a sustainable peace, you're going to have to have a mechanism in which you include more voices, more interest groups, um, in order to find what we call the long-term solutions that go beyond the concrete decision for the legal question. And that's why we move away from the litigation model. model. And we saw that with the ICC because we, we found that um, victims who had given testimony in the ICC felt that they um, their lives were not repaired by participating in the ICC. That may you may have gotten a judgment holding someone accountable for sexual violence. But in the end, they didn't have an increased quality of life that they would have liked to have received some development aid in order to have a house or schooling for their children. And none of that was provided by the court. So their conception of justice and peace um, had nothing to do with litigation. That's an, a very important uh, learning um, point that we, that we received from that experience. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I don't know um, about Latin America. I can see there is a question on chat by anonymous attendee. Uh, and, yes. and, and, and I'm trying to summarize. I, I would focus basically on the last question, on the last part of the question, uh, which says that uh, uh, based on Sir Michael Howard's um, um, understanding about the efforts of good men to abolish war only succeed in making it worse, does it, it, he, he or she, I don't know who is, uh, our attendee who remains anonymous. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, preferably it would be nice if we had the person, you know. Uh, yeah. So he, she asks, uh, does that not make you a little bit worried about simply promoting peace uh, and advocating diversion of funding from keeping people safer and more secure with counter-terrorists? Uh, so um, please, um, yeah. I just read the question, you know. I'm yeah. Not, you're, you're not, <laughs> So yeah. you would like well, to I, I teach I teach counterterrorism. So <laughs> obviously I'm not going to advocate completely doing away with counterterrorism. But um, from teaching counterterrorism, um, the course I teach is actually called Human Rights and Counterterrorism. And when I teach it, people who come from the counterterrorism agencies attend because um, they don't have some so much of a focus on human rights where they're working. Um, to the extent they do, it may be mostly on due process rights and procedural issues regarding litigation, prosecution. Um, but the human rights approach and the peace approach um, is one that goes into soft mechanisms um, of prevention that are very relevant to counterterrorism. So I think they go hand in hand as a tool, but they they have been fragmented in practice because of the division of institutions and agencies. Now, counterterrorism and counterextremism and counter separatism has managed to become mainstreamed into every UN agency I can think of, as well as the NGOs. All of them are doing counterterrorism and extremism. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised as even the Peace Commission or um, UNESCO has uh, somebody working on, on something to do with counterterrorism. So it's not that you have to pick one or the other, it's about um, maybe removing from the periphery the idea that, that peace is something nebulous and uh, not concrete as, um, as, as Kelsen and others were, were afraid of. I've showed you that the court has managed to give very concrete uh, recommendations and conclusions that are uh, addressing concrete um, aspects of structural violence that 
are the elements of uh, root causes for violence and radicalization. So if you don't deal with creating peace, um, you're going to have problems that that uh, reappear uh, within the sphere of counterterrorism anyway. So I think they go together. Yes, thank you very much. And actually, what was very interesting is was especially why, well, how you were highlighting the shift from the negative, exactly as you say, to positive peace. You know, including all these other uh, elements. Uh, Cecilia, it's uh, I have the privilege, you know, to 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 ask uh, one more question, if that's okay, before I go back to the to the audience. And <clears throat> I was thinking today before we start, I was reading the news on Guardia, and apparently, you know, we have a new kind of war. This is at least the EU talks about the hybrid warfare, and that's the instrumentalization of migrants by countries such as uh, Belarus uh, towards the borders with Poland, the borders of the EU. The EU and NATO talk about the hybrid warfare, you know, and they're under attack even. And I was, yes, I smile as well when I was reading that. And I was wondering, you know, your whole work on the sustain of the right to peace, you know, and especially because you mentioned also, we go into this third generation, the communitarian uh, aspects of, of, of right. How, how could that be kind of utilized or what kind of sensibility or framework, normative framework could provide in this discourse as, as legal scholars, as people who we teach students? Thank you. Well, it's about returning to the Kantian perspective that, that no people should be a means to an end, and that includes refugees. So um, when we find re refugees being uh, utilized as part of hybrid warfare, um, this goes against the entire liberal order that, that, that we created with the UN Charter. So the initial drafts for the Declaration of the Right to Peace actually included um, provisions on refugee rights, and they were removed in the final version. Um, but refugees are human beings, and therefore they have um, the same rights to equality and non-discrimination and the aspiration to enjoy peace. And that means the right to seek asylum and not be refooled or turned back at the border. This is illegal. We have a 1951 convention that has been ratified by these states, and they have the obligation, even when they act extraterritorially, not to refool um, these persons. So um, the problem is a complete lack of political will at present to uh, respect the regimes that we created for recognition of refugee rights and um, a displacing of them by policies that are um, oriented towards securing, securing of the borders on, on, on the basis of security or oppressive peace, if you wanna call it. Um, so I, I um, am very saddened by these uh, trends and um, I would very much like uh, a return to a recognition of um, the spirit of the 1951 convention um, which is binding law and uh, um, a, a, a return to uh, cooperation among states to find solutions for people who are ends in themselves. Yes, uh, thank you very much. The more you talk about that, the more we realize, you know, that we can operate as an umbrella norm, you know, that actually mm -hmm. covers all these uh, different uh, issues we deal with. There is a follow-up um, comment question by Helena. And I, would, I think it's in, very interesting because Afghanistan, uh, I was saying to students, I, was, I felt dreadful to walk into class and have a question, what about Afghanistan? You know, and then we, we teach about democracy, human rights and peace. And what happened 20 years after Afghanistan? Uh, and then Helena exactly, you know, highlights the issues, that, the problems about sec the securitization in the name of peace and democracy. And the question, which is actually, I think, a wonderful question to wrap up to some extent is, uh, what kind of productive, positive measures can, should international actors uh, take, you know, without causing more harm to local communities? So how can you convey uh, how can you implement understandings and projects, you know, uh, in collaboration with local communities in order to contribute to peace at the end of the day? Thank you. Yeah, well, again, the, the right to peace um, uh, underscores equality and non-discrimination as, as the key elements of the positive peace. So the biggest concern that almost all international donors have are with the situation of Afghani women and girls who compose the 
majority of persons on the ground in Afghanistan. Now, when we saw um, uh, the withdrawal away from with Afghanistan, uh, we saw pictures of women judges going to Greece, right, Maria? He posted that. <laughs> Uh, the women judges got out, and then we saw women uh, girl soccer players that were given asylum in in, uh, in Italy. And then uh, we saw um, media, people who worked with media or with media-related NGOs going to Mexico and the United States. And the United States gave asylum to those who had worked with American-funded NGOs and with the media outlets. Um, and here we have a problem because you have particular groups very closely tied to, again, first generation rights, uh, freedom of expression and association, and also tried to the, um, the democratic liberal orientation. But most of the women and the girls who are in Afghanistan will have no link to an American funded NGO, will not be working for a media corporation. And the question is, how can we protect them? Number one, against the very real hunger crisis that is coming and has already started to arrive. Um, the threat of displacement, um, those who belong to ethnic minorities are going to be subject to inter intersectional discrimination and uh, forced to undergo practices such as forced marriage um, or lack of access to education. You know, all, all of these um, concerns that we've seen placed in uh, the reports by the relevant uh, NGOs and IOs. Um, so the donors have been tied because they feel on the one hand, if they if they send aid to the Taliban, are they supporting inequality? <laughs> and on the other hand, if they don't send aid, um, are these uh, women going to die of hunger or other extreme? And then again, uh, people should never be a means to an end. They are ends in themselves, and we're going to have to take the higher the higher uh, um, order here. And uh, obviously, uh, sufficient humanitarian aid must be provided and continue dialogue uh, with the Taliban on uh, the importance of equality and non-discrimination as an element of, of sustainable peace has to be emphasized and, and supported uh, through narratives, right? <laughs> yeah. If that's okay, can I, can I go back? That's the last question, you know, can I go back to your last book uh, about Latin America, you know, and I was wondering uh, about the customary understanding of the right to peace, but also, what are these concrete, particular um, characteristics, you know, of Latin America? Was it that there are countries that they have very strong uh, second generation rights, um, constitutions with second generation rights, as it's in Colombia? Uh, definitely the historical context. What makes Latin America, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, of course, is a very special court, but what are these, if you could, in five minutes, you know, tell us a little bit more about because I thought it was really fascinating also this focus. Thank you. Well, I presented to the lawyers of the court. I was so excited to show them because none of them had, they had never looked at the constitutions of the Latin American countries. So they had no idea how peace played out in, the, in this region. And I was so depressed because, because the majority of the iterations of peace in Latin America were the elements of state control that they were, um, the peace is articulated that you have the right to freedom of expression as long as it's peaceful. You have the right to freedom of assembly as long as it's peaceful. So it's a, a status condition of the enjoyment of a liberal right. That is the majority. The second biggest group was on um, what you call negative peace iterations having to do with uh, the prohibition of aggression. The If it's one top international value within Latin America, it's, it's non-intervention and they've enjoyed what's called the long peace because they have not intervened each other's borders in, in, in a significant way in a long time. But that long piece needs to be created internally. And that is the challenge for every Latin American country today. So only a few states in Latin America have justiciable versions of peace. Um, three, exactly. One of which is Colombia. So that's why I'm saying that the, the road to peace is not necessarily through litigation. It is through culture of peace, of working with society and, and trying to uh, change societies that are very hierarchical and polarized and divided into ones that um, are comfortable using uh, mechanisms of uh, cooperation and uh, tolerance and mutual respect in order to solve their problems. 
Uh, Cecilia, uh, on that note, uh, unless, you know, there is any other uh, question uh, or comment, I know, you know, we keep asking you all these questions, but it's a, 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 as you said, it's the 60 years of the World Studies Department, you know, and I don't think that it, we could have a better uh, and more um, relevant uh, discussion on, on peace and on the international law of peace, because we have different understandings about peace. Uh, and, and it's very true, you know, that we live in an era with massive challenges, massive threats to international peace and security, as we say, as I mentioned today, hybrid warfare, uh, through migration or not. And it's uh, very obvious, you know, that from your work, at least my understanding was that, as I told you before, that it operates as an umbrella um, uh, context, accessibility, norm, normative umbrella that we can, uh, we can utilize. And this is very, very important, but also the discourse, how we teach, the, the, the culture of peace, uh, as you say, these are very, very uh, important things. And uh, on that note, um, I would like really to thank you for your time, for this discussion, for introducing us to your, to your work, your ongoing work. And uh, hopefully very soon, you know, we will meet in person when we are allowed uh, by, by the pandemic and other constraints. And we will have the opportunity, you know, to discuss further, uh, what do we mean about, uh, about peace? Because it is, it is very obvious, you know, that it's concept is constantly evolving, as you say, you know, in your on the title of this uh, presentation. So I would like to thank you very much. I would like to thank all the participants, you know, who who attended, who raised questions, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you soon and uh, to seeing the rest of you uh, during the next uh, webinars we have. Cecilia, once more, thank you very very much. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> Bye, thank you very much. Thank you all.